The Orioles offense has been really struggling lately, so I couldn't think of a better time for Cedric Mullins to come up with his first multi-homer gain in over three years. But that's what he did as the O's beat the Red Sox to pull back within a half game of the division lead. I'll recap the win at Fenway Park coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, September 11th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 5-3 to victory over the Boston Red Sox on Tuesday night. I'll get you the five things you need to know from that one, including a huge day at the plate with multiple home runs for Cedric Mullins, another big hit from Adley Rutschman in this series, and a fantastic start from Albert Suarez. But despite the Orioles getting more big hits on Tuesday, they still haven't fixed the issues they've been having, especially with runners in scoring position. So I'll try to break down what is going on for the Orioles' offense in those situations and why such a big change from last year. And then finally, a couple of injury updates as some O's continue to work their way back to the active roster. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. So we start today with an Orioles win, and well, they had lost four or five. It felt like a while since they won a baseball game, and it was great to see them go to Fenway and get a W. Orioles five and the Boston Red Sox three was the final score up in Massachusetts on Tuesday night in game two of a three-game set to even this series at one game apiece. The Orioles get to 83 and 63 with the victory, and thanks to Seth Lugo, who threw seven scoreless with 10 Ks at Yankee Stadium, the Royals beat the Yankees 5-0 on Tuesday night, so the Orioles are right back there, trailing the Yanks by just a half a game, sitting in second place in the AL East. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 5-3 win over the Red Sox. And the first thing you need to know is, well, it was a huge, huge day for Cedric Mullins, who goes 2-4 for four with a walk and a couple of home runs, driving in three runs in the two-hole for the second straight game. And listen, once again, him and Gunnar Henderson have been the only two hot hitters for the Orioles over the past five games. So Hyde for the second straight night, just hitting them one-two in the order, and it worked. Now for Henderson, he had a nice night on Monday. He still had a one-for-four with a walk in this game, but Mullins supplied the big stuff. Cedric Mullins with a solo home run, kind of whipping one around the pesky pole in the top of the first to put the Orioles up one nothing. And then much more of a no-doubter in the third, also off of Red Sox starter Cutter Crawford, crushed a two-run shot into the seats in right field to put the O's up 3-0. He also walked and stole a base in the ninth inning, played another great day of center field defense. And listen, if his bat is starting to come around, and it certainly has, it's been just much better overall in the second half, but specifically here in September, after he was really good in June and July, and then August wasn't much. He is 12 for 30, Cedric Mullins, in September. That is a 400 batting average. He's got a 1333 through the first, 1333 OPS, I should say, through the first 10 days of this month. Now, it's a small sample size, but he's doing a little bit of carrying the Orioles offense right now, and he, he kind of did that on Tuesday night, but the O's need it for how much of a struggle they've been in and for the Orioles and for Cedric Mullins there's been less home runs lately as well and that's you know for Cedric pretty good season he's up to what 17 home runs now with the two blasts on Tuesday maybe a chance to get to 20 we know he hasn't been the same hitter since he had the 30-30 season back in 2021 but Tuesday really showed it two home runs for Mullins that was his first multi-home run game since June 19th of 2021 against the Yankees. It has been well over three years. He did it four times in that 2021 season when he hit 30 bombs. He had four two-homer games. First one since then. Very cool night for Cedric Mullins. 
Second thing you need to know from this one is that Adley Rutschman came through with a little bit of a breakthrough hit with runners in scoring position for the Orioles. We know the O's have had all the struggles in the world with runners in scoring position recently. I'm going to break it even further down in the second segment of today's show. And even in this game, the O's had two on with no outs in the fifth. They had two on in the sixth. Could not bring anyone home. But Adley came up with the bases loaded and two outs in the seventh. And credit goes to Ryan O'Hearn, who kind of fought off an infield single to load the bases, the batter before with two outs and keep the inning alive. Adley comes up. The Red Sox go to the bullpen to bring in a righty to face Adley and get him at his worst side. From the left side, they bring in Luis Guerrero, rookie pitcher, second appearance, really good stuff, but kind of wide-eyed in that spot. And Adley gets behind one and two. The Orioles leading three to one, bases loaded, two outs. You're like, they're going to leave some more runners. And then he works the count back full, and he gets a pitch on the outside corner. Would have been a called strike three had he taken it. And he just doesn't try to do too much. The O's have been talking about how you know, they're doing too much. They're swinging too hard, whatever it may be at the plate with runners in scoring position. He just slaps a ball into left field, a two-run single, huge insurance to extend the lead to 5-1. to one. And listen, that hit and the O'Hearn are, or infield single right before it, those were the only two hits the O's had with runners in scoring position. They had chances. They ended up, it was another tough night in those spots. They ended up overall two for nine in those situations in this win on Tuesday. But it felt like even in the past week, since they stopped scoring against the White Sox, they hadn't even got a hit like that in, in any of those situations. So just to get one, and from Adley Rutschman, who, as we talked about on yesterday's episode, had his first two-hit game in a while, first extra base hit in a while, had his first game with three hard-hit balls in a month and a half on Monday night. So to see him get another big hit on Tuesday, huge for him, huge for the O's offense, maybe, just maybe, it can push them in the right direction. And that one swing is not going to fix everything. And again, it was still an issue, and we'll get to it but maybe that can pick up the entire offense. And speaking of the entire offense, the third thing you need to know from this win is that the O's offense really spread the love in this game. Orioles had the five runs on 10 hits in this one to go along with four walks as well, including two from Anthony Santander. But those 10 hits were spread out nicely. Cedric Mullins had the two home runs. Those are the only two extra base hits the Orioles had. It was eight singles otherwise, but eight singles, one each, from the other eight starters, Henderson, Santander, O'Hearn, Rutschman, Kowser, Mayo, Holiday, and McCann, all each with a single in this game. And none of them came in in huge spots, but they did get the Orioles on base. It was nice to see Kobe Mayo get a hit. Nice to see Jackson Holiday and Colton Kowser get hits. All guys who have certainly been struggling lately as the Orioles' entire offense goes through its struggles. But it feels like it hasn't happened in a while. It feels like, you know, every hitter getting a hit in the lineup that was happening pretty regularly. It felt like in the first half of the season, not as much lately as more guys have gone through bigger slumps and more of the offense has gone through slumps. Could be a sign of, you know, the Orioles need more lineup length. They need more contributions from the bottom half. They need everyone to step up and do their part and feed off each other. It still wasn't the biggest offensive performance. They still only had five runs, but another good step in the right direction for the Orioles. Switching it to the pitching side, the fourth thing you need to know from the O's win at Fenway on Tuesday is that if Cedric Mullins was star number one, certainly Albert Suarez was star 1A, getting the start on the mound for the Orioles in this one. And it's funny because he's coming off, if you combine the line and the team it came against, giving up six runs to the White Sox last week, probably the worst start of Suarez's season. I mean, we, we couldn't believe it. But he pitched that poorly. He was rolling along so well, then got clobbered by the Chicago White Sox. And you're thinking, oh boy, now he's facing a much better offense in a tough park to pitch in. How is this going to go? Well, it went swimmingly for Albert Suarez. Six innings of one run ball for the Orioles veteran righty on just four hits, a career high eight strikeouts to two walks on 101 pitches, no homers, just four hard hit balls for the Red Sox lineup against Suarez in his six innings of work. He was just fantastic. And we've seen him give a, a handful of, you know, six inning one run starts throughout this season. He could arguably be the most valuable Oriole here in 2024. But we haven't quite seen a six inning one run start like this one because this was 21 swings and misses from Albert Suarez in this game on 53 swings. That is a career high whiffs. That is a 40% whiff rate. That is elite. 
and he spread them out. Then I didn't throw the cutter a whole lot, so we only got two there. But six whiffs on the four seamer, seven whiffs on 15 swings on the curveball, six whiffs on 16 swings against the changeup. And the great thing was, it wasn't like they were all chases. A lot of those pitches were in the strike zone as well. His command was great. And usually when we see swing and miss stuff from Albert Suarez, it's a lot of high fastballs. He will pound the fastball. He still threw 39 four-seamers. It was his most used pitch on the night, but the usage was down a little bit. More change-ups, more curveballs, because those things were filthy. Those pitches generally, even when they're on, aren't swing and miss pitches for Suarez. They're more like soft contact, pop-up, slow grounder pitches to get him through innings. On Tuesday, those were swing and miss pitches. This was a different Albert Suarez. The changeup was falling off the table. The curveball had incredible break. That was the nastiest, maybe not the best we've seen Suarez, but that was the filthiest and the nastiest that I have seen Albert Suarez back there on the mound. Again, just we say it every time he pitches, where would the Orioles be without Albert Suarez? It is certainly another night to say that on Tuesday. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 5-3 to three win over the Red Sox on Tuesday, that is that the bullpen had a couple of issues, but they were able to lock it down. CNL Perez was really good in a 1-2-3 seventh to continue a 5-1 game. He came back out there in the eighth, which was the right decision. He's been the Orioles' best lefty. You still had Jaron Duran and Rafael Devers do up to begin the inning. You want him to face those lefties. He gives up a single, but he gets Devers to fly out. And then the Red Sox go to the pinch hitter, Rob Ref Snyder, who crushes lefties. Brandon Hyde had Yenier Cano ready to go, and he brings in Cano. Perfect bullpen management for Hyde. And then Cano just, you know, he gives up, he gets an out, then he gives up a walk, and then an RBI double. And then on an 0-2 pitch, second and third, two outs with a 5-2 lead in the eighth, he balks home a run. Masson didn't have an amazing replay of the balk. It was the first base umpire who called it. It looked a little odd what Cano did, but you couldn't really tell what exactly the balk was. Either way, not a great way to bring in a run. Now, he gets a strikeout to keep it 5-3, but he made things much closer than they needed to be. Sir Anthony Dominguez did give up a two-out single, but he got two Ks. He got the save. He is now 10-10 for 10 in saves as an Oriole. Thank you, Phillies. And the Orioles win the ball game, a much-needed win. They get back within a half game, beating the Red Sox by a score of 5-3. to three. And even though Adley Rutschman did get the big hit with runners in scoring position, what ended up being two huge insurance runs with his bases loaded single in the seventh, it still, again, was a two-for-nine day in those spots. And the Orioles have really struggled. All season, not really struggled, but been worse, but lately, really, really struggled. Read some good pieces about it this week. I've talked about it some. I wanted to break it down further. Let's do a full breakdown. What's going on with the Orioles with runners in scoring position? Is there a need to be an approach change? Is it a mindset change? Is it bad luck? We'll talk about all those things coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Now, you've heard me talk about Game Time, and they're amazing ticket deals to Orioles games, but Game Time now has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. There's amazing deals for Orioles games. Listen, there's only one homestand left. It's the Giants and the Tigers next week. If you want a good deal on a ticket to see the O's one more time in the regular season, Game Time is the place to go. They've got all-in pricing. Don't have to worry about surprise fees. They've got seat views. You can see where you're sitting. And those Game Time picks, curation makes it easier to save on Orioles tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB. That is L O C K E D O N M L B for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. So even with the win on Tuesday, there are clearly still some glaring issues for the Orioles offense, specifically situationally hitting with runners in scoring position. Andy Koska had a great piece in the Baltimore Banner on Tuesday that somewhat inspired me to do this episode. I was Already really planning on diving into this at some point this week, but Andy had a great breakdown, mostly that just had a lot of quotes from a lot of different Orioles hitters in that clubhouse about what's gone wrong, what needs to change, how guys are approaching these situations. And it really made me think because Ryan O'Hearn had some good quotes about 
it's kind of a mindset thing. You know, it's not really that the hitting coach is doing something wrong, teaching something wrong, guys being injured. It seems to be a mindset thing. And I started thinking, how much can you really dive into that? Brandon Hyde's talked about it lately, the Andy article. So let's try to break it down as best I can in this episode here. So let's start with, okay, what have the Orioles done with runners in scoring position throughout the 2024 season? Overall, this has been a great offense, been a top five, at worst top 10, but for a lot of the season, especially early, top five offense in baseball. But with runners in scoring position, hasn't been the same case. A 107 WRC plus with runners in scoring position is 18th best in the majors, 250 average, also 18th, and a 22.3 strikeout rate in those spots. Last thing you want to do is strike out, you know, not even a chance to bring a run home with a grounder or a sack fly. That is 16th. OPS with runners in scoring position, 743, that is 18th. But their hard hit rate via fan graphs, which is a little bit different of a calculation, numbers tend to be a little lower than the baseball savant and stat cast calculation, is 33.5%. That is third highest. So the first thing I notice here, overall, the Orioles have been production-wise about league average with runners in scoring position this year. But they have still hit the ball harder than almost anyone. So the first look told me the O's are having some bad luck with runners in scoring position. And that is some of this. Because overall, before we get into everything, runners in scoring position numbers are generally not sticky year to year. What that means is it's not something that's really easy to replicate success with year after year. because they are kind of random. When you really think about it, there could be a little bit of a mindset change or more pressure on you, and that's certainly true. But in terms of what you're doing at the plate, how much of a difference is there really if you're hitting with a runner on first with two outs or a runner on second with two outs, especially if it's, say, the fourth inning? It's not really much of a difference there in terms of what you are doing and your situation at the plate. So it can be kind of random with just sequencing and situational and who's up with runners in scoring position. That's why it's really hard to look at this year over year. And this next stat will show you that because the Orioles offense, while they've gotten one year older and one more year more experienced, it's really been a very similar lineup personnel wise to what the Orioles sent out there in 2023. But when you look at what the O's did last year, they were one of, if not the best teams with runners in scoring position. Last season for the Orioles, they had a 128 WRC plus. That was best in baseball. 287 batting average with runners in scoring position. Best in baseball. 838 OPS. Best in baseball. 18.7% strikeout rate. Second best in baseball. And then the one that's interesting, 31.4% fan graphs hard hit rate. 18th in baseball. So 2023 is completely flipped. While 2024 was mostly middle of the pack numbers and then hard hit was great. And you're saying they must be getting unlucky. 2023 was top of the line numbers and then middling hard hit rate. It's like, I think the Orioles got lucky or they were getting very unlucky this year, might have gotten a little lucky last year. And that happens a lot with runners in scoring position. Because again, say you come up in the fifth inning in a 1-1 game with a runner on first and two outs. And on a 1-1 pitch, you take a strike and the runner steals second. All of a sudden, you're behind one and two. And this at-bat just became with a runner in scoring position. That's how much these things can change and how random they can truly be, which is why it's really hard for this to be sticky year to year. And the other thing is there's been some thoughts of, okay, are the Orioles just way worse with runners in scoring position than they are in any other spot? So if you look at their overall offensive stats this year, it's a 115 WRC plus that's third, a 250 average is right on par with their runners in scoring position average. That's 10th, 21.7% strikeout rate. Basically the same is 12th, 754 OPS is a little bit higher. That's fifth. And their hard hit rate is about the same. It's in the top five in baseball. So across the board, they are a little bit worse at everything when they're hitting in ru with runners in scoring position versus just overall hitting in any situation. But it's not a big enough of a difference where you're saying, wow, they must be horrendous with runners in scoring position this year. And I mean, it's a 243 average with the bases empty. So the Orioles are actually been better with runners in scoring position than they've, than they've been with bases empty on the year. They're just kind of not getting rewarded for hitting the ball hard. Now, one thing that has happened recently, which was interesting, is 
The Orioles' hard hit rate with runners in scoring position is third in baseball throughout the year. It was third in the first half. It's been 19th in the second half. We can say, how does that happen? Well, they've just had, they've had less chances. The second half of the season has been shorter. 19th in the second half. So you can say their struggles, especially since the All-Star break, have been more to, okay, they're not making as much quality contact. That certainly makes sense, even though the strikeout rate is, is around the same that it has been. So if you're comparing 2024 to 23, really the big difference is the strikeout rate. It was, what, 4% lower last year, 3 to 4% lower in these spots. So the first thing you could say is, okay, the Orioles need to stop striking out so much with runners in scoring position, they'll have more success. That is absolutely correct, because when you come up with second and third and one out and the infield's back, if you get a ground ball to second, you're bringing a run. If you strike out, you don't. That That's how things can change, too, with runners in scoring position. That doesn't even add to your average in those spots, but still helps your team and gets runs on the board. But even if they strike out less, it doesn't mean that they'll also have good luck if they just put the ball in play more, because you could still be putting the ball in play with not quality contact. I mean, they're already hitting it pretty hard and not getting rewarded. So if you hit it more, you have more chances to get rewarded, but it's not a guarantee things are going to be better. It could also be, as we look at this, and again, the struggles are there, certainly, but we're trying to figure out what's going on. It could also be that it's gotten worse recently. We just read it out, right? The hard hit rate has gotten worse. The numbers have gotten worse in the second half slightly. So it's more noticeable as the games get, you feel bigger and bigger. But the biggest thing might be, and this is the most interesting thing I uncovered when doing a lot of this research, is in terms of when in the game these struggles with runners in scoring position are happening. Now, these stats I'm all talking about are going into play on Tuesday. So they do not include Tuesday's game, but of course they include most of the season. With runners in scoring position in high leverage. Now, Fangraphs has three different leverage indexes. They have low leverage, medium leverage, and high leverage. High leverage is generally close game, seventh, eighth, and ninth inning. So the big spots in the game. While the Orioles are hitting 250 overall with runners in scoring position, about middle of the pack in the league, they are hitting just 202 in high leverage situations with runners in scoring position. That is 29th in Major League Baseball. Only the White Sox have hit worse in those exact high leverage runners in scoring position situations this year. And also, not only that, they are striking out 26.8% of the time with runners in scoring position in high leverage. That is worse than the White Sox. That is 30th, dead last in Major League Baseball. Their hard hit rate is 11th, so they're still hitting the ball hard, but they're not putting it in play and they're swinging and missing too much. So there's still some bad luck there, but that is a big strikeout issue. And I think that is, if you want to pinpoint one thing that's going wrong, that is where it is. It's not that they're striking out too much in general in these spots. It's that when the game gets real tough and you're in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and it's a one or two run game and you have these spots, basically what we saw in the eighth and ninth inning on Sunday in the two nothing loss to the Rays when the O's got two on in the eighth and ninth and just struck out a bunch of times and didn't bring anyone home and lost the game. That's when they're swinging and missing. That's when they're not putting the ball in play. That's where it is becoming an issue. And Ryan O'Hearn talked in Andy Koska's piece about just putting too much pressure on himself to come through with runners in scoring position. You heard some similar things from other players, but that might be what we're seeing here is that when the leverage gets high and the pressure's on and you know a hit will change the game, the O's are just putting too much pressure on themselves and, and they are getting unlucky. And again, this is not sticky year to year. But this is the least analytical thing I might ever say on this podcast. And this is half joking, half serious. But in these spots, do some of these O's hitters just not have that dog in them right now with runners in scoring position? I mean, I say it tongue in cheek, but also it could be a little bit of just combination of mindset, pressure, and nerves that specifically in those high leverage runners in scoring position spots, it's getting to them a little bit. And it, I would I would guess it's more mindset than, than nerves. I mean, these guys, when you get to the big leagues to be a starting big leaguer on a first place team, you've gotten over a lot of the pressure and nerves that comes with your baseball career, but it could be just they need to reset and get back into the right mindset. And it's important to say, generally, when you are in high leverage spots, 
you're facing better pitchers. You're facing the closer and the setup man in really good bullpens. So it's tougher to hit in general in those spots because you're facing better pitching. Across the board, mostly, stats go down in high leverage. But this is really, really low. Again, only the White Sox have been worse. So you might think, okay, what did the O's do in those spots last year when they were so good with runners in scoring position? They were even better in high leverage. In 2023, in high leverage spots with runners on second or third base or both, the Orioles hit 311. That was the best in the majors. They had a slow heartbeat and came through in the huge spots. So whatever they did in those specific spots last year, just, just maybe bring it back to this year, find a way. The conclusion is here, that the, the risk stats, they're not sticky. They're kind of random. It's about timing, sequencing, situation, You know who's up in the lineup when these come up. And I, I really think that, yeah, there could be a little bit of an approach change. And yeah, they do have to strike out less in the biggest of big spots. But what could the fix be? I mean, the, the hitting coaches are staying with the same approach that has worked throughout most of the year, that has worked for years now. The hitters rave about this coaching staff. They're trying to do damage in big spots. And that is going to play out well in the long run, especially in the postseason. But what could the fix be? I mean, maybe just to relax a little bit. And that could be easier than thinking you need like major approach changes or major mechanical changes at the plate. Maybe it's just a little bit of a different mindset and relaxing. Again, I don't love coming to conclusions where it's more vibes based than anything, especially on this podcast, but that's what it seems to come to. In the biggest of big spots, the Orioles might be in their heads a little bit and they've got 16 games to figure it out and hopefully they can. Now, the other thing is, it doesn't really help that basically the Orioles' three best hitters this year with runners in scoring position, Jordan Westberg, Heston Kerstad, and Ramon Arias, are currently on the injured list. That does not help, but maybe some good news on that front. We'll get to that to finish off the pod coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks, which is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. All you do at prize picks after you download the app is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. And in September, this is pretty easy. This is pretty fun. One Caleb Williams passing yard. He's already done that. Gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. That's right. Caleb Williams, he's pretty good. It wasn't amazing, but the Bears won. He's pretty good. He's got to throw for one yard. And you can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. And there's one free one with Kayla Williams. So download the app, get your lineup in in 60 seconds, and win money. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use code Locked On MLB, and you'll get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. That's at Prize Picks. Run your game. So to finish things off here today, got a couple of Orioles injury news and notes and updates. We start with Jordan Westberg, who has taken another step forward, been out for a while with that broken hand. There was video of him taking grounders on the field at Fenway Park before Tuesday's game. And the biggest thing was because it was his right hand that is broken. He was not only fielding the ground balls from both third base and second base, but he was putting them in the throwing hand. And he was throwing them across the diamond to first. He played catch in the outfield before the game. Then he took grounders at second and third. He threw to first base. That is huge news for Westberg. Him and Brandon Hyde said he plans to start hitting, quote, soon. We'll see how soon that is, but he is progressing towards being able to start swinging and hitting and hopefully coming back to join this Orioles team before the regular season is over. Also more good news on Heston Kerstad. He is continuing his rehab stint, did so in double A Bowie. On Tuesday night, the Aberdeen and Delmarva seasons are over, so only Bowie and Norfolk are left. So Kerstad will probably play a little bit in Bowie and then go back to AAA Norfolk. And then at that point, you know, hopefully maybe next week if he's feeling okay, the Orioles will decide whether or not he's ready with those concussions to come back to the big leagues. And then finally, not any kind of concrete Ramon Arias update, but we know how well he was swinging it before he went down with the sprained ankle last weekend. Brandon Hyde simply just basically said that Ramon Arias is ahead of schedule in the injury recovery right now. So that is certainly, it can only be a good thing to get, hopefully, these guys back for the Orioles. And also, as I mentioned yesterday, today in AAA, Danny Coulomb makes his first rehab appearance on the mound. So hopefully he is close to returning to the Orioles as well. That'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe 
to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. Also leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you listen to the pod as well. We will be back tomorrow recapping game three between the O's and the Sox. It is the rubber match. Orioles and Red Sox for the O's. Dean Kramer takes the mound, coming off six hitless innings to begin his last start. He will go up against the right-hander Nick Pavetta, 31-year-old with a 4.38 ERA on the season. O's have seen Pavetta a good amount over the past couple of years because he has been with Boston for a while. One start this year against the O's, it was at Camden Yards on August 15th. Orioles got him for three runs over five innings of work. Had a couple of long balls against Pavetta in that one. Hopefully the O's can continue to score on him in Wednesday's game. And then I'll be back on Thursday to recap it all. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.